I'm really excited about this next group we have here, an, an exciting panel. Um, to my left is Ertherin Cousin, who is the executive director of the World Food Program. And to her left is Hans Vestberg, uh, the CEO of Ericsson, who you met earlier. And to Hans's left is Antonio Guterres, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And I think I'll start with questions for our, our UN family colleagues here. Um, you know, I think that uh, World Food Program and uh, the, the High Commission for Refugees is sort of the emergency response group of the, at the UN. And here we are at uh, Rio Plus 20 development conference, you know, people from all over the world. And I think with, uh, with Executive Director Cousin, who, what does Rio Plus 20 and being here at this development conference mean to, mean to the World Food Program? Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today, because it's important that the World Food Program is a part of this discussion. There are 925 million hungry people in the world and 170 million chronically malnourished children under five years of age. You cannot talk about sustainable development without addressing the issues of food security and chronic malnutrition. So that's why WFP is here today. And we believe that this conference has the opportunity to begin to address these issues in a way that doesn't leave that bottom billion, that billion people who are food insecure out of the equation. As you just heard from our colleague from UNIDO, that in 2030, we're expecting that there'll be 8.2 billion people on Earth. That's another one and a half million people to feed. The majority of them will be in Africa. Someone born today, a young girl, a baby girl born today will be 18 in 2030. The question is whether or not that she'll be in a better position to, to address the issues of nourishment so that her body can grow, so that her mind can grow, so that there's hope for her future. It's not just, and we just don't provide emergency response. We also work on disaster risk reduction and um, building resilience in populations to ensure that a mother today can feed her child in the future. That that child that's born today in 2030 has an opportunity for a, a brighter future. That's great, thank you. And I think I'll turn to uh, High Commissioner Guterres. Um, you know, and, and thanks for joining us again. You joined us at Social Good Summit in, in September, and we heard a, a bit about the, the refugee situation in the world. Uh, for, the, for the High Commission, you know, again, why Rio Plus 20? Well, for us, it's very important to look into the displacement of people in a broader context. If one uh, looks at today's megatrends, population growth, we are going to be 9 billion in 2050. Urbanization. Today, 50% of the people live in cities, 2050, 70%. Food insecurity, more than 1 billion people without proper food. Water scarcity, more than 1.5 billion people without water, getting worse. Climate change is probably the defining element of our times. All these factors are getting more and more interlinked. They are enhancing each other's effects, and they are triggering conflict because of the, of the instability generated. For instance, food prices go up, social instability uh, emerges in towns, or scarce, re uh, scarce resources uh, lead to wars. Uh, but not only they trigger conflict, but they destroy environments and they force people to flee. So what we need is a comprehensive response to all these things. The world is getting smaller and smaller uh, there are, for the first time, physical limitations to economic growth, and we need the international community to be able to look into all these things together and to find a comprehensive answer. This has not yet happened until now, let's be frank. And Rio Plus 20 is an opportunity for that to move forward, and this is the key for displacement to diminish, for refugees to prevent refugee crisis, to make less people being forced to move because they can no longer live where uh, they live now. Okay, great, I think, uh, I think a lot of the speakers that we've had throughout the day have talked about the importance of bringing communities together, getting beyond governments to solve all the problems and bringing in business communities, social media communities, the civil society communities. And, and I think that you know, through our, our partnerships with Ericsson, we've seen the great work that Ericsson is doing. And so Hans, I, you know, I would just ask, you know, you, you've been connected to 
partnerships with the UN system, partnerships with the civil society community. You're here in Rio. You know, how is Ericsson so engaged and so involved with this community, and, and what, what drives your connection to it? Uh, uh, first of all, I think this platform that we're creating here together with the partners, the Rio Plus Social, is bringing the conversation outside of what's happening here, and I think that's extremely important. Share ideas, etc. Why we are here, I think we believe so firmly that the telecommunication, the connectivity platform can play a vital role in a sustainable development in this world. Everything from using the mobility, the broadband, to connect it all together. And I think that now it's not about one company can solve something here, nor one country. Uh, nor one organization. So it's so much about having this partnership, talking to different stakeholders. And that's why I'm sitting here now with this, uh, this uh, distinguished guest from the UN, which we're working with both of them, in order to bring our view how we can support with ICT these challenges and with their, of course, uh, experience and knowledge about their specific challenges. And um, as we sit here right now, it's 6.2 billion mobile subscriptions in the world. It's more than four and a half billion unique persons having a mobile phone. That has happened in 25 years. This is the quickest technology development we have ever seen in the history. And it will not stop there. I mean, we will, five years from now, we will have nine billion mobile subscriptions, and we're gonna have five billion people having mobile broadband, meaning access to the internet. We're gonna have three times as many people as of today having access to the internet. And of course, we can together work with education challenges, health healthcare challenges, food challenges, and other challenges by using the connectivity, the social media that you are in order to bring it in. And that's why we are here to be part of that conversation and broaden that conversation, which we think is so important to solve these problems. Because as I said, it's not one organization nor one company. It's it all of us that has to do it. It's a great message for Rio Plus Social, I'd say. Um, uh, uh, back to Executive Director Cousin, you know, we've just heard Hans, you know, go into great detail about the, the numbers of, of people that are connected and how more and more are connected every day. And, and how has that kind of connectivity, the, the access to data that we have now, um, the technology helped the World Food Program to, to better deliver its services on the ground from, as you said, the emergency food delivery to the nutrition work, you know, just through, uh, the, across the spectrum of your work? Well, it, it's we can't do it without it. In 2012, it's impossible to suggest that we can reach the 100 million people that we support in a year without the support of partners like Ericsson, where they can provide for us the technology to assist in bringing benefits. An example, as we talk about the number of, of individuals who are connected via cell phone, we can now provide food vouchers through cell phone, which Erickson helped us do. We can also provide information through vouchers, which FAO is doing. And there's a new, a very innovative program called iCal that provides information on how to support, what foods to provide to your cow in rural Kenya through a cell phone. So we're using the technology that's available out there to support the programs that we deliver. But we're also using technology to build awareness because unless we build awareness and continue to grow the, uh, <clears throat> the support for the work of WFP and the other organizations that are working to address the issues that we've been discussing, then we cannot move forward. It is the awareness, it is the drive, the public will to ensure that global leaders make the decisions that, for, that will benefit those who are most vulnerable. And without that public will that you can build through social media, we will not get that change. And finally, for WFP, it's also about raising funds. WFP is a 100% voluntary organization. And if we don't have the access and support that we receive from so many through social media today, we cannot raise the dollars that are required to ensure that we can deliver the support that so many need across the global community. And, and Hi, Commissioner Gutierrez. You spoke when we were, we were backstage a little about the, the numbers, the refugee numbers, and we have World Refugee Day coming up tomorrow, I believe. And in, in, in terms of dealing with those numbers and how, as you explained, climate change is impacting that, how is, how is the technology and the connectivity helping you? Well, 
last year we had 800,000 new refugees in the world driven by conflict, which is the highest number in the century. And uh, at the present moment, today, we have three acute massive displacement crises by conflict. Syria, Sudan, South Sudan, and Mali. Not to mention the Democratic Republic of Congo, not to mention all the old crises that go on and on and on and on, like Afghanistan or Somalia or Colombia. And so, I mean, we are overwhelmed. And doing business as usual, we cannot respond to this kind of challenge. We need to use new forms of managing our activities. You, we, use to, we need to use technology to empower people for them to be able to assume also the responsibility to find solutions. And technology is essential for that. Two or three examples. If you have solar lamps, you can allow young people to study in the evening in a refugee camp. If you have solar lamps in the streets, you have less women being raped during the night in refugee camps. At the same time, you can empower people by in Kenya, for instance, in Dadaab, uh, in a refugee camp, managing a bank account with a mobile phone. Mm. So, I mean, we need to use the potential of new technology in order to be able to deliver because we are overwhelmed by the challenges of the present, uh, 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 I would say, humanitarian problems in the world. We cannot face them doing, as I said, business as usual. And it's with partnerships with companies like uh, Ericsson or with uh, uh, the civil society organizations. It's with these kind of partnerships that we can multiply our efforts and we can not only address the protection needs and the assistance needs of people, but we can empower people to allow them to help, to help them to solve their own problems. I was going to say, we, we just took a, a question. I just uh, handed a, a question we were taking over social media. You've answered it from, I believe, the, uh, the High Commission side. You know, and and from, the, from the private sector, it says, you know, why are partnerships between organizations and companies so important? And organizations you know, like the United Nations, of course. And, and why is it important to Ericsson to, to partner with the United Nations? I think a partnership like this, as I said, we are all wanting to solve the biggest challenge on earth and we think our technology will bring it and I think the UN organizations are working with many of them so that's why it's so important that our technology will be used to solving those problems. That's important for our shareholders, it's important for our employees, it's important for our customers. So it, it goes hands in hand what we need to do. And I think uh, maybe a little example of that which I think is Please. one of the most powerful examples <laughs> Uh, that I have seen lately, and that was the two Danish brothers that uh, lost a friend in, uh, that, uh, during his transition between different refugee camps. And um, they went to a refugee camp to try to find him, and they came to the refugee camp, and there were hundreds of refugees in the camp, and they started asking, are they here? And, and of course, it's hard to know who is in the refugee camp and start looking for them. And they came back and thought, we need to do something about that, that people that had lost each other during this transition of different refugee camps, they can find each other. At the same time, Ericsson, that basically had built 40, more than 40% of all mobile networks around the world, was raising the first mobile network close to refugee camp. Saw so that surprisingly high amount of refugees has a mobile phone. Enormous many have a mobile phone. So together with UNHCR, and uh, Mr. Gutierrez, and, uh, and these two uh, Danish brothers, and Ericsson, and the mobile operator, we start to building a solution where actually you can start by using your mobile phone, find a refugees that you have lost by entering a lot of data about where I'm coming from, where, 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 where my neighborhood, etc. And just one number, you also get the feeling for it. In the, in the refugee camp in Kenya, you could probably process 700 of these requests a year when you do it manually, coming in and asking for a refugee. Today, we can, can do 650 a day. And in the last one and a half year, we have now more than 135,000 refugees that have signed up for the service to look for their friends, their relatives that have lost on this. And this can only be happening with the partnership of a public company like us, an operator, the great ideas from these young entrepreneurs, they wanted to find it, and also the cooperation of the UN organization. And uh, today we have reconnections where people find each other, and I think it's just amazing how the technology, the mobility, and a simple uh, solution on top of the network, an application, and social media can start finding these refugees uh, and relatives they have lost. And I, 
I, I think it's just amazing. And we have other examples as well. But this was one that, for me, is so powerful about this partnership. Yeah. And, th and those are amazing stories and, and amazing stories of, of connectivity and how social media is being used in, in refugee camps and in, in, in the camps I've, I've visited in Haiti, how, how many people are connected and using them to stay to stay connected to families, whether they're, they're in country there or whether they're, they have family living overseas somewhere, to just create a sense of community. It really is an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing support system. Um, it, in the last few minutes we have left, uh, I, we're at this, throughout Rio Plus Social, we've been kind of looking forward, looking at Rio Plus 20 as, as where are we going to be in 20 years, not you know, looking back to, to 20 years ago here in Rio. So uh, my last question to, to all of you would be, you know, where would you like to see this in 20 years, and how can technology help us get there to, to reach some of the goals that we hope are going to be established here, here at Rio Plus 20? And I'll start with the executive director. Thank you very much. Again, <clears throat> let's go back to that child, that young girl who's, or the baby who's born today who's 18 in 2030. That because of technology, we have the ability to create agriculture that has more drought resistant seeds that support more micronutrient rich diets so that she has the nourishment that she needs to grow both physically and mentally. That we have the school feeding programs that are run by governments and not by and not by uh, UN organizations that are, have the ability to access technology because today we're providing school feeding but we don't have access to education. With technology, we can access information from across the globe that may not be available at country level, giving an opportunity to also nourish her mind as well. So using the technology that's already available in the world today to reach those who don't have access to that technology tomorrow will ensure that we can create a more sustainable world that provides not just for economic growth, but social growth and is also less damaging and does not damage our environment, but moves us all forward together. Hi, Commissioner. I'll have to ask you to answer quickly before we have uh, Hans take us to a special guest. Well, it's, for me, it's very simple. The big deficit we have is a deficit of political leadership to face this broad range of problems together. And uh, my favorite philosopher uh, is Junger Habermas, and he, 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 he says that the essential, the essential part of a democracy is the interflow of communication between the political society and the civil society. What I believe is that technology creates a possibility to strengthen the role of civil society, of individual citizens forcing political leaders to assume the responsibilities to face the challenges that I described in my first intervention and to make in 20 years time the world being able to answer the problems that today we face without the capacity to handle them. Thank you and I'll, I'll have Hans talk about the future um, <laughs> at some other point which I know we will see him again. But right now we'd like to, to go to Christopher Mickelson yeah. and bring him in uh, via Skype. Uh, Christopher is with Refugees United and, and he is joining us from Nairobi and, and is involved with the partnership uh, with Erickson. He's one of the brothers. He's one, 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 of the the bro one of the brothers. And since we've been talking about partnership, we thought we'd have him join and give us a little uh, discussion about what's happening on the ground. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to Hans to explain what, a little bit about the partnership and yeah. uh, go that way. I explained a little bit to Refugee United, but again, it always starts with a great idea and uh, entrepreneurs that want to do something. And uh, I'm extremely pleased to have Christopher Mickelson, one of the brothers that actually came up with the idea, came to Ericsson, came to the UNSCR, and started this solution, Refugee United. And he's in Kenya, and maybe he can say a couple of words what you're doing right now, how do you see the future for Refugee United, and how it uh, is developing. Christopher. Thank you very much, Hans, and hello to everybody. It's great to be here. Um, now, you stole a lot of my thunder, Hans, so I'm going to have to think of whole new things to say about Refugees United. Um, but in honesty, I think that what you've summed up on the stage today very much sums up the, the whole spirit of Refugees United. We're one of the first organizations that were built on technology. My brother and I came in and addressed the situation where we saw that uh, refugee family tracing was carried out predominantly by pen and paper with little collaboration across organizations, across conflicts and borders between the different organizations as such. And we also discovered that there was very little refugee interaction, very little empowerment of the refugees in question when it came to try and find uh, missing loved ones. And we decided to do something about that and built the organization Refugees United. And relatively early in our life, 
uh, reached out to Ericsson and uh, began a partnership that focused on building very powerful mobile platforms using simple technologies like WAP and SMS and USSD and so on, technologies that are largely forgotten in the West, but that are pushing ahead in places across the African continent and giving information to people that have long been without. Um, so what we created were essentially powerful programs that shifts the uh, ability of refugee organizations to collect data on separated families from the centralized uh, organization office, if you will, out into the camps where trained refugees become the touch points to collect this information on family, on places last seen and so on, and then share it across the database. And as Hans uh, noted earlier, we've seen a, a significant increase in the amount of people we can help. Beforehand, a, a successful Kenyan organization would be able to help uh, approximately 750 a year, and we're now seeing the 750 a day that Hans mentioned. And that brings us to about 135,000 refugees being helped right now across the platform, which are in, in the worlds of, of family tracing, just staggering numbers. And none of this could have happened if it hadn't been for the partnership that we enjoy with Ericsson, that we enjoy with UNHCR, that we enjoy with the Kenya Red Cross and so on. And I really think that that's where the strength that Refugees United comes from the ability to leverage each other's strengths to come to a much more combined whole that gives great power to the people we help. Um, and, you know, to, to top this off and to finish finish the day, I, I'll tell you a bit about a, a kid called Jonathan that I spent half the day with. Um, Jonathan, at the age of nine, was separated from his nine family members in the Congo and was forced to flee after a, a militia attack on his village and trotted through the jungle for months until he resurfaced in Uganda from where he traveled to Kenya. And he was picked up, so to speak, by one of our uh, one of our partners in the Dadaab refugee camp and was brought to register to get information and learn how to utilize the systems uh, that we employ. And it took him a couple of weeks or so, but uh, not more than three, four weeks ago, he was able to find his one brother, Jeremy, whom he had not seen nor heard from in 15 years and discovered that he was living in <coughs> Um, you know, in a village not, not more than four or 500 kilometers from where he was. And the brothers are connected now. And it's just one of many stories that we push across the platform quite often and demonstrates the power of technology, demonstrates the fact that 65% of refugees have mobile phones and in giving them the tools to better their own lives, to make educated choices on their own behalf, is providing a very strong foundation for a better life for these 43 million people right now working with. So thank you for having me here today and to give this brief update on where we are. Um, back to you guys. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Christopher. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's a great personal story and a great story of, of partnership, a story of connectivity, and, and a great story of why we all need to be engaged in helping to solve these issues. All of us here, all of the folks on the live stream, all the communities out there that can actually come in and, and make a difference. And I'd like to thank Christopher again, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists. It's a very powerful panel, lots of great messages. Thank you very much.